So this, of course, is the uh, the main monument to the pilgrims here in Plymouth, which represents the things that uh, America as a country thought were important to remember about the pilgrims. We're going to start here at this plaque, which represents the signing of the Mayflower Compact. So if we go back to 1620, as the pilgrims are approaching, they've sighted land on the Mayflower. They have a problem. Their patent was from the Virginia Company, but they were in New England. This means that they were in an area that they did not have legal authorization to be in and did not have a uh, legal form of government set up. And some people on the boat realized this and began to, there's some talk going on, saying, well, we can just go, we're free from our uh, commitments, we can just kind of go off and do whatever we want, start our own colony outside of the separatist uh, leaders. So they, became, they began what Bradford called discontented and mutinous speeches, saying that they would not obey the laws that were put in place. So the leading pilgrims uh, end up writing and deciding to form a compact to establish a government. This is called the Mayflower Compact. It was likely drafted by William Brewster because he had the most political experience, help from others, very likely, uh, possibly Carver and Bradford. Some people suggest that it was even uh, written before they got to the Mayflower, but all of that is speculation. We uh, don't know all that much about its drafting. So let me just start off here by reading what they wrote in this Mayflower Compact. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord, King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland King, defender of the faith, etc. Having undertaken for the glory of God, the advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one of another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof, to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, under which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof we have Hereunder subscribed our names at Cape Cod the 11th of November in the year of the reign of our sovereign Lord, King James, of England, France, and Ireland the 18th, and of Scotland the 54th, in O Domini 1620. So what, what followed below were, were the signatures of almost all the male heads of households and several of the certain servants. Some argue that all adult males on the Mayflower signed it, and that all those who didn't were uh, young servants or those here only temporarily. Uh, so th there's not complete agreement on uh, the, the people who didn't sign it, who they were. But it could have been all the men. At the same time, John Carver is chosen as governor. The plan before they came was for him to be governor, but they confirm it by uh, an election by the people. This is the first elected governor in the New World by the pilgrims here on the Mayflower off the coast of Cape Cod. Plymouth continued to choose governors every year and other officers as necessary. So, the Mayflower Compact. It was at once both an unremarkable and revolutionary thing to do, depending on what perspective you look at it. So the Virginia Company, to the south of here, uh, had given liberty to the plantations formed under their authority to make constitutions and laws, where they were settling far away from the existing government. So other people in Virginia could have made a government like this. The English long had views of the rights of Englishmen. The separatists, of course, had also been living in the Dutch Republic, and there they may have picked up and been influenced by further ideas on, on the rights of men. As far as the election went, it was common in England uh, to elect uh, both parliament and local offices. So in these ways, making a form of government was not remarkable. Electing a governor was not remarkable. But what was remarkable about it? Because it, the important thing about it is it was a milestone. It's a document to be remembered. 
and a moment in time to be remembered. It was the first document of this kind in English America. This was the first permanent English colony in New England, and it was founded on a written constitution agreed to by those who are going to be governed. It was built on a lot of foundations of English common law, of English government, of the separatist theology in particular that went into it. This was something the pilgrims uh, themselves in their writings recognized as an important moment in time. 1636. 16 years later, they referenced back to it, along with other letters of patent that they were later granted by the king. So it was in some way caused by a temporary problem because uh, they needed to keep these rebellious strangers in check, but it was a fundamental expression of their views of government, views that not everyone in England would have necessarily agreed with. And when they, when they made that reference in 1636, it would be expected that they would reference the patents from the king because that would be where most people were viewing their legal authority uh, to settle here. But to reference the compact, that was more revolutionary. That this seemingly temporary arrangement, they still saw it as foundational to their government. So I want to consider four different important parts of this compact and where those ideas were coming from and where they led to. The first is the Doctrine of Covenants. So this is a covenant, a uh, solemn agreement, uh, an oath, of a group of people coming together under God. The pilgrims believed fervently in church covenants. That was how their churches were established. They were local congregations covenanted together. A group of believers uh, form a local church and sign on to a written covenant. They saw Israel itself as a nation that was covenanted together in a similar way to, chur to churches. This is what Robinson wrote about their church covenant. We are knit together as a body in a most strict and sacred bond and covenant of the Lord, of the violation whereof we make great conscience, and by virtue whereof we hold ourselves straightly tied to all care of each other's good. So with the Mayflower Compact, they were bringing that view of the church covenant to the civil sphere. They were establishing a government based on a compact with one another. This is an important thread of history, through history where a government is not formed by a king, uh, by his divine right, but it's formed by people gathering together and agreeing to form a government under uh, the authority of God. Two decades later, there was the Solemn League and Covenant between England and Scotland. And the Scottish Covenanters, as that party uh, grew to be called, they would die in defense of that covenant. People died because of the covenant that they signed, that they saw as foundational to their government. This same theory uh, or principle of covenants is what is behind our Constitution, where we put a document in place, a written agreement, saying here's how our government operates. Here are the powers of the government, here are the rights of the people, and that it goes back to the Mayflower Compact, along with many other things in our history. So the, the second point from this, uh, from this compact <clears throat> was the consent of the governed. This is a compact not dictated from on high, not written by the king, not uh, dictated to the passengers by the, uh, the, the, the leaders from the separatist church. It was formed by the consent and agreement of all the men. They were subject to a government that they themselves were creating and would continue to control by regular yearly votes. They did acknowledge the king of England under whose authority that they had come Yet this principle of the consent of the governed fundamentally contradicted the idea of the divine right of kings. That the king is appointed by God, and that appointment means that he has a divine right to govern the nation however he wants, and that the people have no rights that, that come against the king. This would be the basis for removing tyrannical kings, as would soon be done just a few years later in the English Civil War. Again, a direct a connection to our Declaration of Independence, where the people have a right to alter or abolish a government that does not uh, fulfill the ends for which the people established it, and that it's a government that is derived, it's just powers from the consent of the governed. Third point, the Mayflower Compact was formed by the freeborn citizens of England, not by an aristocracy. This is a big difference from Jamestown. Jamestown, they were coming, and the plan was to set up the same 
uh, feudal-like system that they had in England where there's lords that control much of the land. There's an aristocracy that have a lot more control over the government. This is different. These most people that are coming are not gentry and those that are, uh, are not trying to exercise the powers that their birth may have given them. It was a colony of farming landowners with equal power uh, among the laboring class. They did not, of course, believe in universal suffrage. Only the male heads of households could vote and servants uh, signed on to a temporary restriction of their rights. It's not a complete dissolution of classes, but the, the suffrage that they allowed was far greater than that of English towns. Opposition to aristocracies is a fundamental theme of American history. In some places this goes to the Jeffersonian ideas of the glorification of the working, laboring men, the farmers. Um, when we look at the government that they formed here, it was also a direct democracy. Once a year there would be a general court for voting citizens where governors and officials are chosen and that, that assembly actually votes on laws, the people themselves voting on laws uh, to be implemented in, in the country. So it's not even their representatives, the people themselves are making the colonies laws. This continues to today in many, many New England towns where they have their town meetings. It's a rather unique form of local democracy, direct democracy that we don't have in North Carolina. Our uh, town meetings that we would have are, you have the opportunity to speak to the people that you have elected, but you don't typically have any power to vote them down, which um, is different than a lot of New England towns. That can be traced directly back to the Mayflower Compact in the form of government established here. So last was uh, the separation of church and state. The Mayflower Compact, right from the beginning, was done in the name of God. They saw government as subject to God and to his word, and that the government ought not be doing anything that violated the will of God. The pilgrims, of course, a very religious people. Even England as a whole has uh, a religiosity that would be very foreign to America today. The government was not subject to the church in the pilgrim's view, and the church was not subject to the government. They understood that the church and state were separate, but that did not mean that both were not under God. It was foundational to their separatist view that the state did not dictate the, theolo the theology and practice of the church. And they thought that the church cannot control the state. Their churches uh, were not national churches. They were not established as part of a hierarchy that would go up to the head of state. When we look at it, we may see them as taking this even to an extreme because for them, marriage was not a church ceremony, it was a civil ceremony. Uh, burials, not a church ceremony, a civil ceremony. It was done not by church officials, it was done just by the magistrates. A person could not even hold office in church and state at the same time as uh, I have mentioned. You have people resigning as a deacon to become a governor's assistant. You could only have one of those offices at a time. So this is the similar to this uh, separation of church and state that you have in the uh, early colonies and states of the United States. And there's some of the founders at least supported where there is not an established church, where there is uh, some extent freedom of conscience, but yet there's not a secular government where it's not a separation of God and state, but separation of church and state. They're both uh, equal under God uh, separate jurisdictions. So, uh, th what can we remember from the Mayflower Compact? Uh, the, the Pilgrims did not issue grand statements of political philosophy, but they had a very specific view of government, a very specific view of covenants. The relationship between God, the state, the church, and the people. And they were ready to le live that out, and they were even able to do it in such a way uh, through their uh, humility, through their uh, example to others, they were able to convince people, uh, the strangers, who were not on board with all of their opinions, uh, but they were willing, able to bring them along and to form a very successful local government here. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and share it with your friends. You can also visit www.discerninghistory.com for more videos and other resources.